So we're coming up on a year, I know of a day you'd probably like to forget, but how are you feeling now? So far, so good. No complaints. I mean, things are not as easy as it used to be, but they're doable, you know. You just take every day as it comes and see what happens, you know. It's just mind blowing to see that a year later he's here talking and breathing on his own. <laughs> Uh, lots of things that never were supposed to happen did happen, so we're very, very grateful. But it's not been the easiest year, but we've made it doable and we're thriving, so. <laughs> and what does what your day-to-day -day look like? I have therapy every day. Um, I have physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy. And I do that every single day. Five days a week. Still leave some time for the two of you to be together? Yeah, yeah. She comes with me to therapies and she's there. So, honestly for us it's been, like I said, it's been pretty doable. You're here in front of the Christmas tree now. Mm -hmm. Christmas last year, can only imagine, Chelsea. What's the mood like now this holiday season? Uh, it lives up to the holly jolly mood. <laughs> um, Compared to last season, we had a little Christmas tree in his ICU room. So that definitely didn't go as to plan when it's your first Christmas married and you had all these plans on how you're gonna celebrate it, the traditions you're gonna start. So to be able to actually decorate the tree was the, the best start to the season. Uh, last year, we never actually got to decorating it. We were gonna do it the next day and we never came home. So yeah, it's definitely, a good season and we plan to spend a lot of time with family, friends, and then just really take it all in, so. The life of a first responder's wife is, I imagine, can be a nervous time um, when they go off to work. Do you remember much about that evening and the call that you got? I do actually. Uh, that day we were both home getting ready for work. He was cutting the palm trees outside <laughs> with my dad and I was inside kind of I think I was fixing the Christmas lights because I didn't like how they looked. We were gonna straighten it up and stuff. Um, we both went to work that night and I had gotten a phone call and I declined it because it was an out of state number. So I thought it was spam and they called again. So I answered it and that they had mentioned who they were, it was Lieutenant and that something had happened to Tyler. He was in critical condition at St. Joe's and that they were coming to get me and they asked if I was at work and I said yes and they said okay because they have some at our house and then also some at my work. So I walked by them, I didn't say anything in hopes that wasn't real. <laughs> it was very hard to process. Um, the phone call didn't feel very real. I just kept, I was panicking because I couldn't ask him how he was feeling because I didn't know anything that was happening and I just told him that I had to leave and I had to figure everything else out I guess. So um, the call and then the ride there felt very long. We took the streets and I, the whole time I could only think how critical, like, is it the femur? Was he shot in the femur? Was it a car accident? Was he beaten? I had absolutely no details at that point. So at this point you didn't know, I didn't know at all what had happened? No, I just knew he was in critical condition and that they needed to get me there. And when you go lights and sirens, you kind of know that it's, it's really bad. So I was just waiting and that's when I found out that he was shot and that's the last detail we knew for a couple hours until they told us how many times and where. So I thought of everything. I thought drunk driver hits you. I thought somebody beat you and you know, your spleen can bleed out. You have all these options of what could happen. A lot of them are, can be fixed surgically. Some of them can just be healed with time and you have no idea. And then when they told me he was shot in the head, I was like, um, I had no words. So I could only pray. Yeah. That's what I did. And Tyler, do you remember much about like the moments right before? No. Um, honestly, that whole day is just, I really don't remember anything about that, that day. Even that week is pretty, <clears throat> like, I wouldn't say kind of blurry. I know that Friday we had training with the squad I don't really remember too much about that week in general. When you woke up 
what was that moment like? Who was there? And, and can you explain any of those emotions? Yeah, so I really, I was awake in the ICU, but I wasn't really mentally there. So the ICU, I didn't really remember much. I remembered a little bit about the transport to Craig Hospital. And then I would say maybe March-ish, I kind of was mentally starting to understand what was going on. And then I was like, okay, I got hurt on the job. Because I didn't feel real at first. I was like, no way, this would happen to me. And then I started to come to terms with that. And then I realized I have some stuff that I have to deal with. And then as time went on, I realized I have more things than I thought to deal with. And then my family was visiting and stuff, and I realized, okay, this may be more serious than I thought. So I would say March was kind of my time to really know what was going on. And there was a long period, Chelsea, as well, where I know you couldn't speak back and forth, have conversations. Um, a lot of things were up in the air. You didn't seem on social media anyway, like you were wavering at all, just from an outsider's perspective. What kept you so strong? My faith. Um, I've been a Christian, a believer. I was born into a believer family, so I kind of knew the concept. And at about 16, I devoted my life to Christ. and held on to it, I knew the Bible, I knew what it said, I believed it, but I really just put it into action because it was life and death on the line. That's all I knew I could do. I mean, when you work in the medical field, you already see all the options are out of sight. There's nothing left to do, all the meds are there. And so I remember there was a couple of verses at the top of my head that I was like, okay, if every word of his proves true, which that's what it says too, then I'm gonna take it and I'm gonna run with it and I'm gonna take a leap that's so far out of reach and I did and but there is there was this peace that he was not going to be buried I don't even know how to explain it but when everyone was talking about funerals when they were having people say goodbye to him I didn't because this peace just kind of surpassed everything that I it was impossible for me to almost say it it sounded like I would be disobeying if I did, and like I'd be giving up on him when there was no reason to. His heart was still beating. He couldn't get an MRI yet, so we didn't know like the actual extent to his injuries. So I said, well, unless his heart stops, <laughs> you're still alive and I'm still gonna stay on the firm with you, so. And I also can't think of losing my husband so soon, so that was probably the link to his love. And how do you process those moments, though, where there are people in the medical field and beyond without near as much hope, clearly, as you had? Uh, sometimes I did. Sometimes I just let them talk. And I knew that I can't change their point of view, just like I can't change mine. So I said what I thought. I showed him the monitor. His heart's still there, still beating. It's his own. He wasn't even on machines for that. Sure, he might be on a vent, but... People get off that. <laughs> people live with it, so we'll figure it out. Um, but there were many people that, medical and non, that said I was in denial. And it came quickly to think, oh, shoot, maybe I am. But I just didn't believe it. And so I held on to it, and I kind of felt like the lonesome person sometimes. That, OK, like, I'm really either crazy or God's going to do something so crazy that it's not explainable. And he did. and. I mean, I just didn't really talk to a lot of people at the beginning. People came in and did their own thing and said their own stuff. And I knew that sometimes you have to put up your wall, otherwise yours can come torn down. And I don't want that, so I had to hold on to it. I imagine you've had this conversation with Chelsea already, Tyler, but when you sit here and listen to how strong she was and the conviction to, to keep you going, what does that make you feel like? It makes me feel like I can't let her down because she was so strong and so faithful when I needed it the most. Now she relies on me to be strong and faithful. And I feel like if I'm not, I'm letting her down.
I'm not only letting myself down, but I'm letting her down. And that's worse. I think majority of motivation comes from the ability to, not the ability to, but I don't want to let her down. I can't let her down. She didn't give up on me. And I'm not going to give up on her. What are you able to, to do right now? Uh, physically. So in therapy, I started doing, it's all a bungee mobility training. So it's like a walker style, but and it has wheels and it kind of holds you up. And I started doing that, taking some steps around the, the clinic. So I've been taking steps almost every day, more and more, further and further. I've been doing more around the house. I started last week at loading and unloading the dishwasher. I would say you definitely do more than anybody knows. Um, I mean, you work on standing, you work on being on all fours. You help decorate the Christmas tree. Yeah. You get yourself ready in the morning. Uh, once we're up and going, you can do all your own things. Um, we just discovered you can help with some of your equipment and carrying it to the car, to and from. You transfer into our own personal vehicle, which is nice, because then we can go out and about to the stores, and hopefully soon restaurants. <laughs> no, you do a lot. You gotta give yourself more credit. <laughs> Pretty remarkable bond that you two have very clearly. Do uh, you feel like it's been strengthened through all this? Oh, <laughs> definitely. Definitely. They say you marry your best friend, or you should, that's the advice you get, and I definitely did. Um, I don't think there is another single person on this planet, we don't have children yet, so maybe that'll change things, but to spend every single day with for the last almost a year, I can't speak for him, but I don't get sick of him, so <laughs> we get to spend a lot of times, we do a lot of things we still enjoy, so, I mean, I love him, so. It's easy. I mean, we were married for a good, decent amount before, and our bond was pretty strong. But this test really showed me what we had and what we need to have, how to make it stronger, what it needs to have, you know? And I really think that this has made us stronger. Our bond, definitely. How about your bond uh, with your career? Uh, I know you're focusing on your health right now, uh, yeah. but being a police officer, um, these things are always a possibility. Right. Uh, but now having gone through it, how do you feel about your decision to, to be a cop and to want to remain a cop? So, this, I signed up for this, knowing, knowing that it could happen. And the support that, because it did happen from the department has been exponential. It's been more than I can ask for. And because they're so supportive of me in, in this time, it makes me want to go back even more. I still want to do it. I, if the department won't let me, I'll, I'd love to go back. That's what I strive for. But it hasn't, the injury hasn't changed my feelings for the career, the job at all. I still love it. So you want to be a police officer again? I do, that's what I strive for. Is that one of the goals keeping you going during physical therapy? That's exactly. That's exactly it. Is I want to get back to where I was so I can do what I was doing. And going back to work motivates me every day. Do you recognize the odds that you are currently beating? Does that ever go through your mind? So to me, it just feels like a challenge I have to overcome but she, she'll tell me like 
And the doctors will tell my kid, you're like, you are not supposed to be doing this. So, to me, it's just, I have to overcome it to get back to where I want to be. But when I really sit back and realize where I should be, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Are, are you surprised at all at, at how far he's come? I'm mind boggled. I don't, it leaves us speechless that when you think of where you were last year, where you think of where you were two months ago, I mean, we're always comparing notes from his therapist or looking at old videos and it's like, man, like just a month ago you couldn't do this and now you're doing it. Or just a little while ago you couldn't do this. Remember when we got home, this wasn't even in our future yet. And like, we're already here. So, I mean, I'm not very familiar with spinal cord injuries myself until this happened, but I mean, it's, it's surreal. It's miraculous because Things that aren't supposed to be moving are moving. Things that aren't supposed to be working aren't working. Um, so it's just like a waiting game, but we have hope and we have faith that it's only going to look so much different next Christmas. Is there any, any, anything you could think of that, that is the reason you're here talking to us today? Only God. I realize that you cannot do anything on your own without Him. And... He is the only reason why I'm here. He's the only reason why I'm progressing. And the more he does, the less I have to do. And the more he does, the better I do. So he's the reason why I can, or he's the reason why I can credit the progression, even just sitting here today. I give it all to him because we all know that I shouldn't be here. But he is, he deserves all the credit because I I shouldn't be here. Oh, it's all God. I mean, it could have gone a bunch of different ways. And we know what you've been through has been more than a valley. We've had to climb mountains higher that we're still not to the top yet, but I mean, he really took what was meant for evil and turned it for good. And something that could have destroyed our family, could have destroyed my marriage, could have, I mean, caused us to go all sorts of ways. He really turned it for good. And we're ever, forever grateful for that because our marriage is even stronger and we know that it can withhold any trial. And hopefully one day we'll be able to pass on the story and the testimony to our children and raise them up to do good in the next generation too. And I mean, it's just, it's crazy to think about that. We don't deserve this goodness, but here we are, so. Exactly. You know, I saw this video on social media the other day of um, of you and your brother, Matt, at his firefighter graduation for the Phoenix Fire Department. I have to say, I mean, I, I started crying just watching it. What was that moment like for you and your sibling after all that's happened? It was nerve wracking. Just because the motor skills aren't what they used to be, I'm working on that. So the badge pinning requires some more fine motor skills. So before the graduation, I was practicing with my own badge and my own uh, uniform. Because he asked me, he's like, hey, can you pin me? And I was like, okay, I need to practice because otherwise I'm going to look like an idiot. (laughs) So, yeah, it was was definitely nerve-wracking. But they made it easier for me. But it was was one of the proudest nerve-wracking moments ever, I ever experienced. Uh, you mentioned how you you were more nervous just to physically be able to pin it. Yeah. Where where are you right now? Like, what's the most recent thing that you've done that is that is new to you over the last year? So, yesterday actually in therapy, they had some dots or circles set up around me, and I was standing in the parallel bars, which 
I can stand normally. And they, the therapist had me touch with my legs. Like, they have numbers on them. So she'll say some numbers, and with my legs, I have to reach out and touch those numbers in order. And what surprised me yesterday was I was able to reach across the other side and touch those numbers. So just being able to control my legs to reach across my body and touch those numbers, to me, that was like, whoa. Yeah. Something new all the time. Every day. Is there anything you want to say to, to other members of the department, members of the community um, who've been pulling for you? Uh, thank you. Thank you is an understatement. Um, the amount of support we've received is not something you can gather on your own. Um, it's as little as our friends and families to our neighborhood, to the entire department and their spouses and families and other departments. And then we've even received prayers and cards and a bunch of things from out of state, even overseas. And it's mind blowing that there are people who are still to this day praying for us, rooting us on, are willing to take care of us in any way, shape or form that they can. And we don't think we'll ever be able to repay them back. We know we won't be able to repay them back. So we just, if there was a better way than to say just thank you, we would do it. So we pray that each person will be rewarded in their own ways and with the, what they need because we can't do it on our own. I think that that's exactly what I want to say. Just thank you. I have no other words but thank you because every single person has just been extremely supportive in ways I can't imagine. I would never be able to fathom. So I'm just so thankful. I'm extremely humbled. I don't know how or why or what, but it's just been, they've made it so much easier for me to focus on healing because they take care of the stuff that I don't have to. Because I don't know how to say it properly, but thank you, I guess you can say. I'm just extremely thankful, extremely thankful. Well, I know I can speak for the department, but I think I could probably speak for the rest of the nation. You're an inspiration to all of us, and we, um, we're really proud of you. And we wish you the best. Thank you. Thank you, guys.